Well, nice to see some faces I know and some new faces that I don't know. The first time I saw an actual manuscript, I was in the British Library manuscript room more than 50 years ago. I had filled in the necessary forms in a little room overlooking the reading room. Some of you may have been there. I first had to identify myself and give a good reason why I should be allowed to handle the manuscript at all. The beadle brought here out an old-fashioned pen and inkwell, and with due ceremony I signed my name in the large parchment book and then sat in the reading room waiting for the book to be delivered to me. When it came and I opened it, the hair stood up on the back of my neck as I looked at the marvellous illuminations and the music notation and I realised that some man, for it was almost certainly was a man, had sat in front of this parchment more than 400 years earlier with his quill pens, brushes and inks and made this book. I felt I was there with him in the room beside the monastery kitchen for warmth through all the daylight hours. At the very end of this book was written in black ink, Laus Deo, praise be to God, and if anyone should damage this book, may they burn in hell. Of course, this book was the work of more than one person, one scribe for ruling the page, another for the music lines, another for the notation, another for the text, and yet another for the artwork. There is something absolutely immediate about handling a manuscript, even down to the smell of the parchment, the wormholes, and often the finger marks. It is not the same to look at a manuscript page on an iPad as it is to see the real thing. And this has the potential to allow people to relate to the past in a very tangible way. In looking at manuscripts, we normally are looking at texts that tell us stories that we can read or understand, or at images whose meaning may be real or symbolic, or a mixture of the two. Often images illuminate or explain the textual material and much study of manuscripts is truly interdisciplinary, drawing on the expertise of paleographers, of art historians and liturgists amongst others. The relationship between the dots on the folios and meanings can be more or less direct. In approaching music manuscripts, we're confronted by another dimension. The dots on the folio of a music manuscript stand for something completely different, sound and, one could argue, have no meaning outside the performance of the music itself. So if we look at the first manuscript here, there are dots on the page. I don't know how much meaning they have to any of you, but we can change that. If I can get it to go. And we can listen to a bit of it. That's from that manuscript. That was from a symposium that was held in June of this year. Unfortunately, we didn't tape the whole piece, but it's from that manuscript. Okay. So what can a person who is not musically trained learn from looking at music manuscripts, such as the ones in the Sydney collection? As it turns out, quite a lot. And today, I want to introduce you to some aspects of a small number of manuscripts that will help you approach this material. In 2002, Fisher Library bought two manuscripts of known Spanish origin for its rare books and special collections library. Today, this sta collection stands at almost 30 items and is attracting international attention as a significant collection of Spanish liturgical music manuscripts from approximately 1250 to 1800, with a concentration in the late 16th and early 17th centuries. The combination of the manuscripts themselves and a growing contextual collection of primary and second ma secondary material make this a collection that is unique in the Southern Hemisphere. It is also a great resource for those students here who are studying liturgy, paleography, texts, music or art history, or any of the related disciplines. As I said at the opening, there's nothing quite like holding actual manuscript in your hands and contemplating its past. So to the books. Are they all the same? No, there are a number of different kinds of books, with each type having a different function. Some books have just texts and other texts and music. And if you look at the slide, I've just laid this out for you because I may be using these terms and this you can 
imagine what they mean. So missals have text only. Gradual has the music of the same of the mass. The breviaries have texts of the divine office. The antiphonal is the music of the divine office. And then there are other books that have just parts of the liturgy. So you have books for Holy Week or books for the Virgin Mary or books for processions throughout the year. Before we focus on some specific aspects of some of the manuscripts, let me give you a little background. Spanish liturgical books up to about 1600 can be categorised by type, depending on just part, which part of the liturgy they carry, by format, that is manuscript or print, or by liturgical priorities which changed with time. Some of these contain just texts, as you can see, some liturgical chant and some are a mixture. It is impossible to know just what percentage of manuscripts produced have survived, and so we can only go on what we have. What we do know is that those books that contain texts only, that's the Missal for the Mass and Breviary for the Divine Office, seem to have survived in greater numbers than books containing music for the Mass, the Gradual, the Divine Office, the Antiphonal, or for small subsets of the liturgy, for example, Holy Week books or processionals. Similarly, books of the same typologies existed for cathedral use in different parts of Spain and for each of the active religious orders, that is, Benedictines, G Dominicans, Geronimites, and so on. The contents are all subtly different and vary by region and by religious order. So do all these books look the same? Well, no. There are subtle differences which each have different meanings. Some manuscript books were produced as looks objects for important people or commissioned by patrons. Many of these have survived due to their value and the fact that they were well looked after and often venerated as precious objects at the altar. We have two such looks books, one of which the so-called Turkey manuscript is out for you to look at today and Fiona's next to Fiona. But by far the greatest number of survivors were plain books made for everyday use. We have a number of books like this and we can see how heavily they were used by the finger marks and sometimes the additions in the margins or even the cartoons probably drawn by bored choristers. Let's just glance at some of these books and see what we can learn from them. Without necessarily being able to read music, there are things that you can see. So the first one, this is a gradual music for the mass. They've, the staves, that's what the music is written on, have five lines and this is a Spanish marker in the 16th century. There are different kinds of letters, the, the red letters and the, bla the black letters and they show different parts of the text which are guides for the eye of the chorister for where they're going to sing next, so it's pretty easy. These books are all par parchment, that is, they're animal skins. Some are from young small beasts and that's called vellum and other larger older, uh, larger older animals, and that's parchment. And we've got a vellum manuscript and a parchment manuscript over there for you to look at. They're put together in something called Gregory's Rule, and we'll see that later, where the skin side of the animal and the skin side of the animal are put together, and the hair side and the hair side are put together, so that you can see one opening is very pale, and the next opening might be quite dark. This Kyrie is probably I would say from the hair side. This material was very expensive, so if the liturgical needs changed, text could be scraped off and new ones overwritten, as in the next slide. And I've marked here with a, with a red uh, marking here, a place where in fact the music has been scraped off, waiting for new music to be written for the new liturgical needs. And you can see there are also doodlings and cartoons around the edges of this manuscript. We don't know who made them. This is for Christmas Day. Another thing that you can see are what we call the rubrics. Now, rubric stands for red, so they're the red words. And the red words in the manuscript do several things. They can tell us, they can give instructions for the singers, they can tell you what the next feast is, they can tell you something about performance. In this case, this, in this gradual, the rubrics tell us that this contains the masses that are for particular saints which are specially celebrated in Spain. And this is in the fest festival of the expectation of the Virgin Mary. Here's another rubrics. This one at the bottom here 
is for on the, a manuscript we call The Lady of the Snows. And this is for the festival of St. Mary, St. Maria of the Snows at Vespers and this is the antiphon. So that's telling us something about what is happening next. So that's rubrics. So you can learn a lot from looking at the rubrics. Here we've got a gradual and it's, I've opened that manuscript at this particular opening where you've got black notes and, and text and then you've got some red. This is a Gloria and the red parts have been added in to the original text. So it's new music and it's new text and they're shown in red. And these additions in red are called tropes. So this is a troped Gloria and the, this is what the, the red stands for. So if you see red in the middle of a manuscript like this where everything is black, something different is happening. So have a look, it might tell you further on in this manuscript there are red bits that show, go into three parts at the same time. So it, the, the rubrics will tell you something. Sometimes, but not very often, we're lucky enough to get a manuscript in which at the end of the manuscript we're told something about the scribe, the date and the place. In this particular manuscript we're told, it, in 1599, we're told this manuscript was made in the, in the city of Burgos by Petrus Colomares in the year of our Lord uh, 1599 for the church of Santa Maria del Campo. So that's a lot of information which since most of these manuscripts that we have in this collection came to us with no information at all about where they came from, who made them uh, or anything else, uh, this is terrific uh, information. Now let's move to the pictures. Pictures of various kinds were often relevant or explanatory to the text or the liturgical occasion. In fact, there's a whole story to be told of the use of pictures in early printed books to tell the story for those who cannot read. Not everybody was expected to be able to read, so if there were a lot of pictures and you could follow the picture, you, pictures, you could tell more or less what was going on. We can think of early cartoons or, on the other hand, precious art. So the next slide is from the manuscript that's over there next to Fiona. Um, this manuscript is a processional. We call it the Turkey manuscript because on the bottom left-hand corner in the red square is the first known picture of a turkey in a European manuscript, which is pretty exciting. This is a luxurious manuscript and was probably made for a particular person and it cost a lot of money. In the top corner, you see a little picture, which is a T for Tanquam. Now, look at that picture. Its size, when you look at the manuscript, is about a little bit bigger than a postage stamp. But if you blow it up, you can see the detail. And there's an extraordinary amount of detail in that tiny little picture. So clearly, this was for Christmas Day. This, this chant was for Christmas Day. So there's the baby Jesus, there's Mary, there's Joseph, there's the ox, there's a couple of fish, which were uh, tra traditional pictures for Christendom, etc. So that's telling us a lot, it just in the corner of that manuscript, before we get to any of the music. So if you can't read music, um, but you look at this manuscript, you're learning something about when it was for. Related to that manuscript, and as it turned out, by the same set of scribes <coughs> for the same church, that is Seville Cathedral, we came by this by absolute serendipity and chance, and it is the most wonderful thing to have found it, um, is a, a book for, with a text for the Office for the Dead, which often is something that happens at the end of a processional. In this processional, the texts tell us exactly which parts of the cathedral the various texts were to be used. And the picture of the peacock at the bottom, this is a book for the Office for the Dead, the peacock was the medieval symbol for eternal life. So here again, the picture is telling us the story. We don't know, we can't read that text, but we look at this picture and we can see, first of all, that the decorations are the same as they were in the Turkey manuscript, and secondly, that the pictures at the bottom tell us something about the manuscript. 
There is, as we uh, have found out, we've just published a book. We've just published a book on four of our processionals, of which these are two. Uh, we have found out that there is, in fact, to go with these two manuscripts, a third manuscript that is related, probably by the same scribes, that completes the liturgy. So, if there are any donors out there. Um, <laughs> We'd be looking for this, and it'll probably cost a lot of money if we ever find it. Okay, the next one, same book. Um, in the corner there is an F for Fidelium. Now that picture is also going to tell us something about the faithful. Here we have a picture of a, of a stork guarding the city of God, the gates of the city of God, and you can see the gates on the left there. He's got one foot up. And if you look very carefully, you can see he went to, he's guarding the city and he goes to sleep with a stone in his beak. If he should have to go to sleep, his beak will open, the stone will fall on his foot, he'll wake up and go back to guarding the city of God. So again, here's the story. The next one is a later manuscript. This is an antiphonal for the Augustinian order and the picture on the Feast of St. Augustine goes as follows. And look carefully. There's a story that St. Augustine was walking on the beach and contemplating the mystery of the Trinity. Then he saw a boy in front of him who had dug a hole in the sand and was going out to the sea again and again and bringing some water to pour into the hole. St. Augustine said to him, what are you doing? I'm going to pour the entire ocean into this hole. That is impossible. The whole ocean will not fit into the hole you've made, said St. Augustine. The boy replied, and you cannot fit the Trinity in your tiny little brain. The story concludes by saying that the boy vanished because St. Augustine had been talking to an angel. Finally, some contemporary documents and some light that they shed on some of our manuscripts. And I'm focusing here on one kind of manuscript, a processional, and two feasts that are in most processionals. While seemingly a simple book containing liturgical chant of the music to be sung in a processional, the processional has an interdisciplinary reach and the tiny little processional on the right here is one that would be carried around by the monks on a procession. So he's carrying it around and he's singing from it. Scholars from a number, um, from a number of different disciplines have long studied processions and their books from the perspectives of their own areas of interest. Art historians are interested in the decorative aspects, both for their intrinsic and also their symbolic values. Liturgical scholars can gain insights into practices from a regional, local or monastic point of view. Historians of drama and performance have studied the procession and its books, and processions have been used as markers of religious and sacred space. Spanish documents contemporary with medieval and early modern processionals talk about the use of singers, dancers and instrumentalists in processions, thereby expanding the concept of a book containing a single line of music to its place as one strand of the religious performance, perform performative moment. And our processional number 380 on the end here, as you will see when you look carefully at it, has only got one line of music. Although our books on their own tell only a very small part of the story, details of performance, participants, places for particular feasts and so on, can be supplied from the documentary sources. This material is rich and detailed and survives in wonderfully alive language. And I'm now talking about manuscript 380, which is the one that's right here on the end. I've got it open here at part of the Palm Sunday uh, procession. And you'll see in the red square there, the text Gloria Laus, and then Ingrediente starts with the, with the the blue eye. From a document of 1567, we read, the procession of Palm Sunday may begin and follow as of those of the other festive days, except that in the two first stations they wait a little until the fa Father Master of Ceremonies signals for them proceed. And in the third station, at the end of the antiphon, which they have sung, they begin in Canto de Organo. Those have, who have already been in the church sing Gloria Laus, those inside singing the verse Israel S2, the choir responds from outside Gloria Laus, which you can see up there. The subdeacon who lifts up the cross taps with it on the door and it opens immediately and the corrector begins the response Ingrediente Domino. 
Each member of the choir then lifts a palm and holds it in his hands while singing the Passion. And finally, for the procession of Corpus Christi, it is clear from the Corpus Christi material in our manuscript that this book was to be used with others. As here, the two Corpus Christi hymns, Pange Lingua, which was the first slide you saw at the beginning and heard, and Sacri Solemnus are not included. And a document from 1567 specifically names these hymns as being essential to the Corpus Christi procession's ritual. It also appears that some of the material for Corpus Christi is now missing from Fisher 380. This can be supplied from other Geronimite processionals, including our manuscript 407. So here's Pange Lingua again, which just the dots on the page, but you can imagine now what it sounds like because you've already heard it. Here's just a snippet from a document of 1567 that describes the Corpus procession in the Geronimite liturgy. For the procession of Corpus, the six senior monks signal the Padre Vicario to lift the pallium. They leave the choir carrying lit candles. Those who have the office of Thirubilarios, that is the people carrying the incense, have to be priests. At the first station from the church is sung Pange Lingua, which we see here, and at the end the singers say the verse on their knees and the celebrant the prayer on foot. And the same thing happens in the other stations. And so it goes with more detail. One onlooker was Gabriel de Talavera, who in 1597 spoke of Corpus Christi processions that leave from the church and the cloister. And note the emotive language that he uses. At the entrance to the church and going to the stations of the cloister, they sound with great sweetness and variety of voices, organs and bells, which with their different and sweet accord make agreeable consonants and aid in this marvellous harmony. That which is caused with so much sweetness by the ministriles with their concertedness and various instruments. Throughout the extant, extant Geronimite documents of the time, we see co comments like, for the ritual here, see both the processional and the customary of other books, often named with dates and folio numbers. And it is the master of the chapel and the corrector of the chant who always had the final say regarding the details of practice. And as you can see, that's a very, very lively picture. But all we have is that little book with one line of music. That's all we've got to go on. But there are all these other documents that fill in a context and a background that show us exactly what was happening. In building up a picture of the context within which, within which our processionals would have existed, we need to remember that they never existed without their wider context, including the singers and other musicians who gave their contents life and meaning. I hope that through this tiny glimpse into the world of our Spanish liturgical manuscripts, you can already get a feeling for some of the ways that the contents and meanings emerge and an appreciation of the fact that scholars of many disciplines cooperate to bring the documents on the parchment folios to life. And a postscript. We want to make our material available to scholars internationally and a digitisation program is now underway. Most of the books in the Spanish collection are now up on the web. However, a trip to the rare book room downstairs on level one, armed with a manuscript number and a valid ID, will enable you to see and touch the manuscripts for yourselves. You will need to call ahead or book a visit, as many of the manuscripts are kept in a locked safe, which needs to be accessed by those with a key. Thank you. And if we have any questions, um, I'll give them a go. I hope you'll all go and have a look. Yeah, James. Um, thanks, Jane, for a great talk. Um, I just wanted to ask you about was one of the earlier antiphonals, the one from Bucos, where the, you have the scribes in the yes. city. Um, and he starts in Latin and he slips into Spanish. Yes. The second half of it. Does that sort of happen a lot in these manuscripts? Uh, yes, it can. Yes, it can. It can. I mean, quite often, there are some manuscripts in which all of that stuff is in Spanish. Um, but it's very common, as I said at the beginning, from the British Museum manuscript, that you do get this last deo at the end, and then, you know, you'll burn in hell if you muck this manuscript up. Right. <laughs> Don't do it. Yeah. So the rest is in Spanish after last deo? Sometimes, yeah, depending, depending on where the manuscript's from. I, I forget what that manuscript was I looked at, the first one, but yeah, it can be a mixture. Yeah. 
Thank you. Thanks so much, Jen. Um, I'm just really curious as to um, some of the imagery you mentioned with the fish yeah. on the table manuscript, and I think it was on there was another one as well. It was like a, a face on the side. Ah, the faces. The faces. Well, I think they're just decoration, but if you look at, uh, I don't know if we can go back to it. Um, yeah, it was a face there. If you look at that face there, um, in fact, you can see a face looking this way. And if you look very carefully, you can see four faces looking the other way on that same thing. There are four, see if you can find them. There are four faces looking the other way. So he's looking at me and he's looking, they're looking at you. So what, what was a, a, um, an eye becomes a chin, becomes a nose all the way down. When you can see, when you finally can see one, you'll get the rest of them. And that's just decoration. I don't think that, I mean, as far as I know, that doesn't have any great meaning. Um, but we get the same, the same faces in this manuscript as indeed we get in a Turkey manuscript. So it's the same scribe or the same group of scribes. And the way this second, the way this second purchase came about was we had the Turkey manuscript. And we've been, the library has been working with a, a book dealer in Paris and Chicago. And they send us from time to time new manuscripts that they've got for sale. And they'd sent us, they'd, I got to know the woman quite well, and she sent me a notice about two manuscripts, that were, more manuscripts that were for sale. One had music and the other one did not. In fact, I think the one with the music might have been 380. And the other one did not, and so I took no notice. And then, and it was too, they were too expensive anyway. We couldn't buy them, we couldn't go there. A year later, she comes back and says, we've got a sale on. You could have these two manuscripts for blah. So I sent her an email and said, look, I haven't seen the one without, without the music. Send me a couple of pictures. My email pinged off in the middle of the night. And as one does, one looks at it. And I just jumped out of bed because it was the same scribe. You know, it was quite clear to me that this new manuscript belonged with the, with the Turkey manuscript. And thanks to the good people of the library, um, we bought it. And uh, it was a terrific buy. But we now know that these two between them have two thirds of the liturgy for that occasion. There's another book out there with some more chants in it. So, so you have to be awake for <laughs> in the middle of the night to see what's happening. Yeah. If anyone's interested, we have we have now there has now just been a book published on our four processionals called Mapping Processions, and we was we had it for sale at the conference. It's been published in Canada, um, and if anyone's interested, we have a few more copies for sale downstairs, which is it's it's a whole book about four of our processionals, it's, and it's. We've already had the first review, which has come from Spain, and it's very exciting. Anyone interested, feel free to come and talk to me. I'll use it over here. Okay. Done? I think so. Okay. Yes. Good. Thank you so much, Jane. That's all right. Thank you.